Mormon Mental Health Podcast is a production of the Open Stories Foundation and relies on donations from its listeners like you. To help keep this podcast alive, please consider becoming a monthly subscriber. Any amount will make a difference. You can click the right-hand donate button on mormonmentalhealth.org. All contributions are tax-deductible within the United States and go towards podcast production and building community support and program Jesus development for Mormons saved. on various paths and journeys. Thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Lundgren. I'm a practicing therapist in the Salt Lake City area in Utah, and I'm super excited to interview our special guest for today. And before we get started, a couple things to mention. So first, Mormon Mental Health Podcast is sustained nearly entirely through donations from listeners and it costs about and at least five thousand dollars per year just to cover the cost so as you can imagine any donation is is very helpful and go directly to sustaining the podcast and so you can do this directly from the podcast website which is mormonmentalhealth.org and sometimes you know people can't uh, donate in financial ways totally okay uh, other ways you can support us is by liking our facebook page you can share links Uh, You can tell a friend. You can also provide some feedback or comments, which are always welcome on any of the topics on these places. And you can also recommend topics. So if there's something that's interesting to you, you know, go ahead and throw a comment on any of these places and we'll make sure to incorporate that in future podcasts. So that having been said, it is my pleasure to introduce my guest today, whom I will call EP. He asked to remain somewhat anonymous, which is, you know, it happens perfectly okay. And recently I was conversing on a Facebook group regarding um, some sexuality content, which, you know, I think is just wonderful. And he reached out to me on Facebook and said, hey, you might be interested in this book that I have authored regarding sexuality in the Mormon experience. And I, he sent it to me, an electronic copy, and I read through uh, most of it, admittedly, not all of it, uh, but oh my goodness, like it was so wonderful to see so many helpful topics for faithful and I suppose even, you know, transitioning Mormons as well that can have a one-stop shop for a lot of really strong and accurate resources regarding human sexuality. So with that, EP, welcome to Mormon Mental Health Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. And um, thanks also, you're kind about my willingness or, or desire to remain anonymous. You're kinder than I am. It bugs the heck out of me, but I am married. And my wife, who is also a member of the church, uh, so I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My wife is also, and she finds it just too exposing to um, to have our name publicly on the book. Um, so just forgive me. I'm sorry, uh, but that's that's where we are right now. So the book is entitled, and it was very good. And the pen name we went under was Earthly Parents. I couldn't um, bring myself to give a pen name that might sound like a real person because didn't even want to give away that. My, e- my ego is high enough to want my name on it. So at least you know it's a pseudonym. Um, and before we get anywhere else, if you want a free copy of this book, you may have a PDF of it. Just email me at earthlyparents at gmail.com. So I'll say that right at the beginning. Um, we're doing this as uh, an act of service. I think that's wonderful. And not that it would be a problem if you chose to you know, uh, sell copies of the book. I think you have copies on and through Audible, Amazon, iTunes, that kind of thing. That's correct. So you can get it through through those sites and also through Barnes and Noble if you want hard copies or if you want uh, Kindle or Nook um, and you don't just like a PDF. I would say Barnes and Noble is cheaper. They just are less expensive mm-hmm. for them to make it. So I would go with them if you want a hard copy. If you want um, the Audible book, obviously um, Audible would be a good choice or iTunes. Sure. Wonderful. All right, EP. Thank you. I I appreciate that. Well, tell us a little bit about you, where you came from, your religious background, family of origin, that kind of stuff. stuff. Sure. So um, I I am, uh, as I said, I'm a practicing member of the church. I've been a member of the church my whole life. Um, But my my father was a member, my mother, and is a member, my mother is and was not. So I got the, the fortune 
misfortune, the, the, it, the experience of going to one church, to Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, one week. And then the next week I would go to either an evangelical church or a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church, um, week after week after week for years. So that gave me a couple of, I think, different perspectives um, than somebody who grows up in the church solely might. Uh, I don't know that those are the driving factors for why I chose to write a book about sexuality, um, but those were certainly factors that were in there that that uh, I think gives a little bit of, I, I know which parts of the church are um, more akin to the gospel as opposed to the culture that we grew up in, that, that culture of... Um, that, that culture that we uh, as members of the church have grown up with, that's the same culture in large part that evangelicals and, and, um, and members of uh, the Baptist church, the Southern Baptist church grew up with at the same time I was in the seventies and eighties with uh, kind of a purity culture, those same tropes that we hear of the, uh, the crushed piece of aluminum foil and how it's difficult to unwrap as a, as a trope for sexual purity or um, the licked lollipop, those kinds of truly damaging kinds of tropes. Those, those ones are not just in our church. It's, uh, it, was, it was a culture. Right. And seeing that culture allowed, I think, allows me to separate a little bit at the time from what was the culture versus what something that I believed was inspired or a uh, gospel. I don't have to have those things be one and the same. And it's easy, I think, for just about anybody who grows up in a strong culture to think that the culture and the religion are one and they are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so these aren't just things that, that people that come from a Mormon background experience, but they're, they're things that you've seen in other faith traditions, probably around the world, but we see them here in the United States. I have. I think that if I were to put my finger on, and this is, you know, having read the book and now having thought about it for a while, um, some of the some of the things that we as a faith do well and poorly that brings us to a place that's a little bit short of where we would want to be for married, healthy, joyful sexuality. Mm -hmm. Those things don't quite meet up. Mm -hmm. um, the things that are good include um, divinity of the body uh, as a gift from God, those sorts of things. The things that make it sometimes a little more challenging is a tendency to, if we don't know the answer, not to figure out the answer, but to look for a more detailed, obscure answer somewhere in someone else's writing. And that, I think, at times hinders us from being able to take our questions to the Lord it sometimes hinders us from being able to have open questions because we feel as though if we just knew a few more details and had a little bit more obscure text that we could bring into it, then we could perhaps figure something out. And you don't see quite that same level um, within, at least I didn't see quite that same level within Baptists and evangelicals sometimes, and they would certainly quote verses and knew them very, very well. But um, it wasn't quite the same everything's got to be true. I have to look for just the right thing that will tell me what to do. It's not a question of developing our own ethics sometimes mm -hmm. and figuring out for ourselves what is right mm -hmm. or figuring out how to be good people. It's trying to find the right code somewhere within the text or, this, uh, or the sayings of uh, different church leaders. So that is a difference that I see, but, uh, and, and some things are strengths, but some things are weaknesses there. And it does kind of leave us in that gap position, which I think that gap, if we think about where we, where we typically are deposited by our religion might be good. Our culture might not be so good. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but there it is. And there's a gap between that and sexuality we might want to have or want for our children to have. And certainly I want for my own children. So I have seven kids. And that was an impetus, in fact, for writing this book was I didn't see anything out there that was both acceptable to the culture, it spoke to the culture, and was comprehensive sex ed, medically accurate, realistic, told you what to do, not in, not in vague language, not embarrassed, just tells you. Um, that idea of the guide to getting it on, which is fantastic, but is uh, very much a secular book and would be uh, offensive, I think, to 
uh, to many members of the church, uh, but has great material. Well, how do we get that kind of material where that level of understanding can come in and bring us over some of those gaps? And some of the gaps are just knowledge gaps. Mm -hmm. Other ones are psychological gaps, which I'm sure you run into um, more than I do, but uh, you, you, see, you certainly see them and you can see how they would get there. We can talk about that if you'd like. Yeah, no worries. I think that's a really good overview and what motivated you to create this book. And, and frankly, one of the things that appealed to me most is how you, in a very appropriate and delicate way, used frank and direct language to describe something that provides value for the reader. Well, thank you. That, that, and that's intentional. And the reason to do it in, in a frank way, as opposed to beating around the bush, is that when you beat around the bush, you automatically give the impression that maybe we shouldn't talk about this. Mm -hmm. But if you are direct, you are able to get across things that otherwise would be, would seem more, mm, not sacred, but secret and maybe a little shameful. So going in and just saying, it takes, it takes about 20 minutes of non-genital touch for a, a woman to be ready for genital touch. And then 20 minutes or more, maybe an hour of direct clitoral stimulation for a woman to be ready uh, or possible to experience an orgasm. That, that's important. But if I, I didn't say that, if I, if I just put this in terms of the microwave oven versus the convection oven or the pressure cooker and didn't really tell you, then it would seem a little bit mysterious and also maybe a little bit scary and putting it in very frank tones, which is something we're counseled to do as parents. We are counseled. And that's, that's definitely a, train, a teaching I took to heart. We are counseled to be direct without, without, uh, without shame in how we describe what is a gift of God. Um, and we are, as parents, we are directed also in, uh, in Handbook 2 to be the primary source of, source of sex education for our children. Mm -hmm. This is a duty if we take the words to be um, true. And yeah. that's what we have to do. And I love that concept of it's a duty to not only be educated and experience in a healthy way, uh, sexuality within uh, the relationship of a marriage typically. And, and, and so when I look at the law of chastity as an example, the law of chastity is often uh, thought of as being a list of things that you should not do. And and I, and I think that's true, but also I think that the definition of the law of chastity should incorporate health, healthy sexual behaviors as well. I hope so. I mean, it seems like that would be um, hurtful and wrong not to do so and unhappy um, if we chose not to do that. We do enter into a marriage relationship. It's not just a special friendship, but it is um, an expected that we are in a sexual relationship, uh, bodies permitting. So this is not this isn't just a choice that we make after the fact. It's that, that's what we're entering into. I'm not sure everybody, obviously not everybody thinks that when they, when they get into marriage, that isn't though, honestly, the, that isn't what I hear most often from readers or those that I, um, that I surveyed prior to writing the book. And in the course of writing the book, I surveyed 95 um, uh, members of the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints to ask them what their wedding night uh, was like, what they wish they had learned, etc. And you do see elements of the gap in there. You don't typically see the idea that sex is off the table when we're married, but a couple. They're outliers, and, and I've gotten those from bishops that have emailed me for the book so that they could use it with their own, uh, the people in, in their wards um, that have had three kids and sex uh, intercourse fewer than 10 times in their marriage. Um, or, um, uh, or, or a reader, that I, I'll be a little circumspect here, but who clearly cannot have, uh, he, he cannot have sex because he feels as though he was, he was uh, trained as a youth and encouraged to have no sexual feelings whatsoever. And so uh, thank, thank goodness his biology is kind of catching up with him after I don't know how many years of marriage and how many kids um, uh, conceived through masturbation and sperm transfer, but that's that's where this you know person sadly is, and and so there are a few like that. I think more commonly, what I hear and what I what I read when um, people respond to the survey is a basic lack of understanding, 
of female, uh, mostly female sexual response, uh, what needs to be done to uh, to have um, to have the wife uh, or woman have a have a pleasant experience, especially on a wedding night. Uh, the idea that we have to have intercourse is sex when that is more of a male mode of sexuality. Mm -hmm. And uh, many 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 women are perfectly happy not having intercourse or don't use intercourse to reach orgasm, and so that knowing that that pressure is off that you have to somehow use intercourse as the way to have sex changes the life of a lot of people. And then physically what you do um, in, uh, in, in what's, I don't want to say what's allowed, but what's at least on the table to consider. Um, uh, because we, despite the fact that we choose to make up a lot of rules at times or choose to go to the lowest common denominator of the most oppressive uh, rule that someone has ever thought of or spoken from the pulpit, that doesn't make it right. I mean, church doctrine is not what any church leader has said at any one time. Uh, we've had multiple conference talks on that. So if that's something that people are struggling with, where this one person said one thing at one time, well, forget about it because that's not that's not how official church doctrine works. So you can just look it up on the, on the official church website to see something like that. Right. You have a, there's a lot more play um, in what's possible and allowed, and this is something that we should be uh, trying to figure out with our spouses and with sure. um, and the Lord. I, I love that, and as we know that um, human sexuality is an experience that evolves over a lifespan. Individuals, you know. Uh, bodies age, uh, things change, we have babies, even, you know, before these things happen, you know, as we're developing in our adolescent, we're exploring, hopefully in, in healthy ways for the person, uh, their own sexuality. But culturally, there's an evolution. If you go back, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, pornography, as an example, was not something that was widely available in the same way it is today. Um, STIs, you know, there's, there's, different risk factors that exist today that need to be considered. And there's treatments for those things while maybe a hundred years ago, there was not. We have cultural variations uh, of what is appropriate socially in terms of attire, presentation, you know, all of this stuff. There's an evolution of attitude to your point where any one church leader may have a perspective of what's relevant at the time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that attitude is something that we need to hold on to in the same way. And I, I like how you said it. I think it's important for us to, as wherever one is in their faith, to seek out, you know, to the Lord or to their higher power, whatever their belief is, and say, what's right for me? And then to bring that contract and that element into the contract of the relationship. That's true. And, and I think that's a great perspective, too. I think if I were to say that the, probably the number one question I get from, uh, from readers um, when they email me is, is oral sex allowed? Wait, I thought that wasn't allowed. <laughs> that, that's very, very common. Um, and, and here, knowing and being able to convey that the backstory of there was a, you know, a time in 1982 for about 10 months where the church put out a statement, the First Presidency put out a statement saying that it, would, uh, it was it had interpreted oral sex as being unnatural, um, and so it was not something that was allowed um, to get a temple recommend. And and then they were told another letter comes out ten months later saying, "Yeah, stop asking that question. <laughs> stop asking uh, intimate details." Um, there, I think, not everybody knows about the second letter, and and that means that a lot of people are living in fear mm -hmm. and pain. Uh, of wanting something or doing something that they feel may be, uh, may be wrong. And that's a question I do get a lot. I get that. For, I've gotten that from members of state presidencies. I've gotten that from members of um, bishoprics and bishops. So it's not, it's not just rank and file who are confused about the history or just don't have the full history. And knowing that um, I understand relieves people of some stress that they they had. Uh, other people, it's a little little bit hard because I, and I didn't bring it up in the book at all, other than just go. This is how you do oral sex, <laughs> I, I, you know, in in in, um, in some how to detail without worrying about it because m my kids may never have heard it that there was even this question, and I didn't want to raise it with them and for that generation, you know, perpetuate this. Um, well, it's a myth that it's doctrine. It's uh, not a myth that it was said, but it's a myth that it's doctrine, um, according to 
according to the church itself. So there, there we have it. So a wonderful introduction, and I'd really like to spend some time talking about some of the content that we're alluding to. Tell us maybe the things that uh, you find most helpful or maybe some of the struggles that come out of uh, believing members or, or any of that. What, where would you like to start? Sure. So I, I, the way I organized it is what would, uh, what would a person who likely was raised in, in the faith know? And what would they not know? What would have to be said to get them from point A, which is where our culture deposits us, across a gap to point B, which is happy, loving, enjoyable, uh, pain-free um, sexual experiences as a, as a married couple. Mm -hmm. And in thinking carefully through all the things that you need to do to believe that, there's a little bit of gospel um, teaching that needs to go in there, just sometimes to, to erase some of the misconceptions or preconceptions. I don't spend a lot of time on this. I, I'm, uh, and and to, be, to be perfectly clear, I do this as a parent. Uh, th that is my only authority in something like this. I am not a therapist. Um, I'm trained in, in molecular biology, but that has only passing relevance to this uh, subject. I, I, um, and I'm not a, not a high church leader of any stature whatsoever, but I am a parent. And that's who has the responsibility at this point. So I take that responsibility pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. And that included figuring out all those places where I thought, you know what, my kids or by extension, others may have this gap to go over. Mm -hmm. And part of it is mindset. Being really, as you, as you kind of mentioned, uh, the law of chastity is not merely thou shalt not, but a thou shalt. And what does that mean? What does that look like for somebody who's a member of the church? So those that have difficulty with it likely have been used to suppressing their sexuality or they've um, made sexuality a secret part of them because it's unacceptable, possibly um, driven by, um, you know, accompanied by porn um, use because th those, you know, the, the secretness and the porn is enough to kind of break through the barrier so they're able to be sexual um, before they're married or even after they're married. Um, and, and those that suppress it then try to put it off into a, a little box. And those things tend to, uh, I, and I'm listening to you and others, <laughs> others in the mental health community, that makes you not integrated, not one person. You're the person who thinks that their thoughts are, are wicked and tries to have like two people in mind. That's exhausting. That is exhausting mentally. What, you're, what mentally I think makes more sense and is happier and healthier is to be sexual and feel good about it. And that, yes, that means certain activities, meaning you know, with certain people, you know, such as a spouse, and not other people, such as not your spouse, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's this carnal thing that is not appropriate. It is a gift from God. And being able to accept that as a gift and understand that gift, and then be able to share that gift with a spouse, I think is a, a much better and happier approach to how to think about it. So that's the first part of where, where I would start it, with members of the faith uh, in particular is, is to help them see what, what there is to, to frame it appropriately. And after that, then it's, it's all the things that um, most people in America would need a lot of this. You have to, it's helpful to understand that there's a libido difference that is expected. That's not saying that the man is a high libido and the woman is, the, uh, is not. Um, it just means that there are two people and any two people will have differences in sex drives. And that difference can be either disturbing and destructive of a marriage or expected and dealt with in a marriage in a way that is, um, that is kind and is not frustrating to both, um, both or, or one of the, the people mm -hmm. in, in the marriage. So introducing that idea so that people don't, have the misconception that they have to be the same sex drive or want the same things or enjoy the same things or be interested in the same thing sexually or the same frequency. Introducing that concept of a libido difference as something like hunger, which we understand if somebody's hungry, we don't feel bad that we're not hungry too. If we're hungry, we don't feel bad that somebody else is, is not hungry. And we don't feel bad if I like sushi and you like pizza. We just that's just part of life. Knowing that, I think, can help people get over that next gap 
you're going to ask right. a question. No, I, I just wanted to uh, kind of riff on what you're saying. It, it is, and yes, there is libido difference, and sometimes it can be dramatic, and sometimes it changes. In fact, we know biologically that most men, that, that their libido will taper off after, you know, a decade or two. Um, and then women quite often, uh, their libido increases. But there's also life changes, pregnancy, stressors, trauma, or the healing from trauma can dramatically affect the libido balance between partners. And so you're right. It, I think the discussion should be more about where am I today? How, what does our relationship look like today? And how do we incorporate healthy sexuality in a way that accommodates for this variation and change in, in libido? Exactly. And then beyond a libido difference, which everybody will have to some extent or another, then it's uh, then there's a lot of mechanics. Um, there's there's the mechanics of uh, Emily Nagotsky's um, uh, break and um, accelerator idea of there's a sexual excitation ex system, mm -hmm. something that's more like an accelerator on a car um, where I see something or perceive a sexual stimulus and therefore I get excited sexually. And the important part that most people don't inherently know is that there's also a braking system or at least two braking systems of the sexual inhibition system. Um, and that system turns off, uh, turns us off. And knowing that that system is there then changes how we think about preparing for sexuality. And that seemed like an important thing that it's not that our culture has let us down. It's just something that has become known more recently um, on this where if somebody is like, well, you know, they're just not into sex, that, that can feel pretty hurtful. But if you realize that the reason is that the, the brakes are on, the sexual inhibit inhibition system is being engaged, then you can choose to lock the door and have your spouse see that you are locking the door. You can choose to clean up something that otherwise will be a task that will weigh on and distract the person who, um, who has a, a stronger sexual inhibition system. So the next part of the book is describing that. Mm -hmm. And then into the female anatomy, male anatomy, uh, the exact how-tos of how to, um, uh, to uh, experience orgasm for men and for women um, so that it's not a big mystery of what you do. Um, and th this includes manual stimulation, oral sex, uh, intercourse, um, and, uh, and the, the sexual cycle mm -hmm. so that you understand how, how uh, if, if you don't know, as an example, and it's, it's known now, fairly well by a lot of people, but not everybody, that it, that it takes longer for a female to um, generally to, to reach a, uh, to achieve an orgasm. So if you, if you don't know that and you expect it to be done on the man's time frame, usually, then it's not, it's just not going to work. And if you don't know that, then just no orgasms. Right. This is what you're talking about, the, the, the timing difference? or yeah. uh, so men have a refractory period. Women don't experience this. Um, women can have multiple orgasms typically. Again, there's always exceptions to this, but um, you illustrate this and, and with some clarity describe this uh, cycle. It, yeah, and, and, and there it's, it helps to know the anatomy in, in, uh, because the anatomy then drives understanding for those that are into anatomy or if you like to work on cars and you think, oh, well, the carburetor is messed up and therefore this is going to happen and it makes sense to you. So the anatomy difference you would need to know is that uh, uh, a penis is like balloons with one-way valves. Uh, the corpus callosum, uh, the, the corpus callosum, the, the cavernosa, uh, not the corpus callosum, uh, the cavernosa, uh, the, 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 the two different tanks, so to speak, or balloons that fill up with, uh, with blood have valves that are very tight. So once they fill up, then it shuts the kind of the, the, the outward flow and it becomes, uh, you know, rigid and, and, uh, and able to, uh, uh, to penetrate. And now that one way valve is not true of a female. Females have a, a clitoris and a clitoral system that is about the same size as a penis, believe it or not. And so, but it's all interior and 
it's it, it includes um, it includes areas that do fill up with blood, but they don't have the same one way valves, so they don't become hard in the same way. They become puffy, and those one way valves take it's it's like filling up a bathtub with the drain open a bit. It takes longer, and the the longer it, it, it's the rare woman who can ha achieve an orgasm. Sorry, experience an orgasm in the time that most men can. Um, yeah, uh, often 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour is not unexpected, um, even with direct clitoral stimulation, which is required, um, for those tissues to puff up and become kind of puffier. And knowing that then allows you to say, okay, well, it's going to take longer. And then, as you mentioned, that, that physiologically, when um, most men orgasm, they have a refractory period where stimulation becomes um, uh, too tingly. It doesn't feel good. Um, and then they and some are unable to um, uh, to become erect for a day, an hour, ten minutes, um, and, and so it's just not it's and then that's not true of women. That one way valve sort of thing where it goes down and then there's a release of a different kind of hormone that then that kind of keeps things from refilling. That doesn't happen with women. So if you get through a little bit of the too tingly period, or there may be no too tingly period for a woman following an orgasm. And some percentage of women, it's not everyone, but um, have learned the trick of keeping with the pleasure and slowly working back up so that uh, you can have multiple orgasms. So yes, that's not a myth, that's, that, that does happen. It's been seen in laboratory settings to where people finally just quit because time to go, five o'clock <laughs> uh, with the Kinsey Institute, I think, or Masters and Johnson. Um, so th those were, um, th those are, things that have been shown in, in, in actuality. And knowing those things then also brings us to something that is important for most couples. And knowing that if I start with intercourse when the man is ready, it will n very likely not be the time that uh, the woman is ready. Mm -hmm. And if, it, it, so it's a, it's a question of timing. You can choose to try to have stimulation so that you have simultaneous orgasms, but that will certainly require you to be very careful about your timing. And keep in mind that the typical man is not going to be able to sustain uh, an erection past a minute or two or five um, at most um, uh, uh, while in the vagina. So that's not, like, the timing has to be pretty good. This is not, it's, it's not, a, not a forgiving time you know, window to do so. And something that, is more likely or more common is that you won't have simultaneous orgasms or even uh, the woman won't have orgasm during intercourse because that same clitoral structure, big though it is, the size of the penis though it is, is not set up to receive much stimulation from, from a penis. And that I think is a surprise to a lot of people, especially a lot of men, because you think, well, I mean, it's got to feel great. I mean, that's you it's going to feel great for her. It feels great for me, that sort of thought, but it doesn't. Those, those nerves, those pleasure nerves are mostly routed around the vagina because the vagina is a dangerous place for nerves. You could be stretched or hurt by a baby coming through there sometime. So much of the stimulation is going to be uh, essentially all, um, the most important part is going to be the clitoris, which is the penis does not do much to our clitoris. It's, it's rare that the penis does. And when it does, it's not because the man is particularly well endowed, but um, because the woman, at least it correlates with the distance between the, the urethra and the clitoris. If it's short, then either the physiology or the, um, or the hormones are just right that those women more often are able to have a hands-free orgasm. And there, 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 I think that that's something that, that people really, really need to know because it's so hurtful and, and harmful to people if they think, I don't know how to have sex the right way. I can't have an orgasm from intercourse. Well, that's, there's a word for that. That's normal. That is totally normal. It's a, it's a, a very rare woman who is able to have that without any clitoral stimulation. And, Almost all the women, uh, something like 95% of the women that do um, uh, are, are able to um, experience an orgasm, prefer it to also have clitoral stimulation at the, at the same time. So mm -hmm. knowing that, and it's a little bit more of a Rube Goldberg kind of thing where somebody's rubbing, uh, the woman or the man is rubbing the clitoris or a vibrator is involved, it, is, it, is the way to go 
if the, if your if your choice is that you wish to have an orgasm during the intercourse, well, knowing that's important. Otherwise, people just start to feel bad that they're wrong and they're broken. And you're not wrong. And you're not broken. You're just normal. Yeah. No, I, this is wonderful dialogue. I appreciate your candor, which is again the the tenor of the book tends to read in this way. You know, delicate yet yet poignant. clients that come from That's right. So where do you,
whatever that looks like for them, how can they explore sexually in a way that doesn't create unhealthy consequences, either whether that's emotionally or socially, right? Because we, we all have a very diverse set of, of interests and needs. And that conversation really is not had. In other words, the pamphlet that youth receive that outlines a fairly strict governance of what is and is not appropriate sexual behavior. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily a big fan of it for a variety of reasons, but I also know that it can be helpful at a stage or at an age. And that guidance doesn't necessarily translate into sex, to healthy sexual attitudes, uh, education and experiences later in life. So while your book is appropriately centered around uh, marriage relationships and sexuality within those types of situations, I think the information is extremely helpful for people that that are currently not married or are not in committed relationships. Oh, I'm so glad. I didn't write it for someone who has uh, chosen or not chosen and, and just hasn't been married for many, many years that, that they uh, perhaps wanted it and, and just aren't. Mm -hmm. um, because it didn't work out for whatever reason. I, I didn't write it for that audience, but I'm so, so happy that it might help somebody like that feel okay about it. Mm -hmm. that, that's just wonderful. Yeah, I, I totally interrupted you. Uh, were there any other uh, major themes or stories that you've heard about from readers? Mm. <laughs> this is one that might actually be up your alley in terms of um, what you, um, or what the Mormon Mental Health uh, Association would be, would care about. I got uh, I got an email from a reader who was very thankful that he finally felt okay about his sexuality after X number of years of marriage. Then I got an email from his wife who was not so happy that I had sent such a book and put this man back in his treatment. I say in quotes, <laughs> uh, they have been in treatment for uh, sex addiction and trauma um, that sounds like normal sexual behavior. I think, to just about anybody who might have read about it, you know, like somebody who wants sex. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know that for sure, but it sure sounds that way. And uh, the wife was grilling me on where I would have gotten my crazy ideas. What porn did I watch? And if you read the book, you will likely laugh uh, because I'm not a porn viewer. <laughs> it's not my, not my thing not to go out and watch videos of people having sex. Um, it makes me feel kind of not good. So that, that has never been something I've done. And it's very vanilla, in fact, what I'm talking about in, in the book. There's, there's nothing that's even like done by fewer than 15% of married couples you know, on a regular basis. So that, that somebody would find these things to be threatening says that a couple of things, like some people are really having some relationship issues. Um, uh, and more disturbing to me was that some supposed trauma, sex trauma expert is, uh, is uh, basically, I don't know, it seems like Svengali or something like that, where they're keeping this person in treatment for years. Um, and it seems like just to me as, as a person and not, not an expert, that doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right at all. And I don't know what's going on, but so, some people do not seem like they're on the up and up. Yeah, and I suppose that's there's always those situations where providers or individuals, you know, hold more conservative or more traditional, rigid perspectives, and that's okay, right? Because some people, you know, that's that's what they need to 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 operate in a healthy way. But in general, I like the approach you're taking. I I think it's a fantastic resource uh, because it follows from where I sit, which again, to your point, is somewhat limited in. Um, in the populations that I serve. But the, the general trajectory of this discourse, I feel is going towards more open, candid discussions, acceptance, tolerance, and providing resources that, that allow for people that, I think mean, this is most people, to have an experience, really beautiful sexual uh, function in, in their relationships in ways that will fundamentally change not only the quality of the relationship, but I think in a, a more healthier social uh, condition for everybody. One of the things that Spencer W. Kimball said was that when they went back and looked at the divorces in the church, as, they, as he said, as we did, so they did some kind of study, 
he said the number one reason for divorces was that they didn't get along sexually. And I think if we think about those that are, I don't know if that's true still, but I suspect it has at least part of it, uh, it, where getting this to be something that brings couples closer together and happier, as opposed to the thing that is the number one problem in their life that dominates their thinking and makes life seem worthless or miserable, which is those that, that are having problems, that's, that's how they feel. Um, getting that changed is, is, is the difference between campfires that need to be, uh, that, that, are, that are going out and sh share no light whatsoever and need to be lighted and tended constantly, and those that warm the next, the next fire ring over. Th this is not just fun and games. This is really important. Uh, it's really important stuff. And, and couples can be so much happier if they choose to be. And sometimes it's just a gap of a little bit of information. If it's that, my book can help. It's free. Just email me for it. Yeah, I love that. I had a conversation with a colleague of mine regarding because uh, regarding how sexual intimacy is so healing and helpful for relationships. And um, I thought about it for a while and we, we kind of came up with this idea that there really are very few things in a committed relationship in a marriage as an example that are more vulnerable than being totally naked and sharing that, per, that really intimate and private part of not only your body, but how your body responds. It's very vulnerable, very vulnerable. And when your partner whom you love accepts you for who you are, because you have information, because you have experience and you've reached a new level of intimacy, then it is very difficult to walk away and not feel that in the extreme vulnerability of that situation, you are accepted and loved for who you are. And this is just the psychological aspect of it, not to mention how our, our, our body or our brains create uh, neurochemicals such, such, such as oxytocin that makes us feel safe, makes us feel loved and accepted. We need this. This isn't, this isn't just for making babies. This isn't just for fun because we need to, you know, get a release. This is a very strong social thing that I don't think enough couples experience the way they should. I think that's probably fair. And there are things that we can do to make it so. Yeah. I love it. EP, this has been absolutely amazing. Was there anything that we didn't talk about that you feel is important for our listeners? Not that we didn't talk about, but I'll just repeat the email address, earthlyparents okay, sure. at gmail.com. Yeah, fantastic. And I know that, again, if you search for uh, the title of the book, which is, and it was very good, um, you're likely to find this book listed on some some other websites that uh, sell books like, you know, Audible, Amazon, iTunes, Barnes & Noble will carry copies as well. Uh, thank you for your email. I'm sure that uh, some of our listeners will want to reach out and get a PDF copy. And of course, they could probably provide feedback to the same email as well. Of course. Imagine. Yeah. And then if uh, for our listeners, if you have any comments uh, about this particular podcast, you're welcome to leave comments on our Facebook page or, you know, our website, uh, mormonmentalhealth.org. Um, we would welcome that. Um, again, thank you, EP, for your time. This has been delightful. And thank you again for providing this resource uh, for so many people that need this information. It's the best part of my day when I get emails of somebody that I can help. So thank you for giving me at least uh, a little bit more of a microphone that I'd be able to. I also want to thank Natasha Helfer Parker for her incredible page by page review before publication. Thank you, Natasha. Yes, thank you. I appreciate all of this. Thanks for joining us today on Mormon Mental Health Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us and become a monthly subscriber at mormonmentalhealth.org. The goals of this podcast include education, advocacy, and the mental health and general well-being of Mormons and their families. We can't further this work without your support. Music for this episode was provided by the Lower Lights. Over last tempestuous sea Chart and compass came from thee Jesus say
hiding rock and treasure show. Chart and compass came for me. Jesus saved. Then while he 